Looking for a bank you can trust? Look no further than Home Trust Bank, the premier banking service provider of our region and dedicated sponsor of Talking Ship. Jeff, did you know that for nearly 100 years, Home Trust Bank has been building relationships with customers based on integrity and trust? Whether you need an account, investment help, or a home or business loan, they've got you covered. I did. I actually refinanced my house with Home Trust. Headquartered in Asheville, Home Trust employs people who live in our neighborhoods and care deeply about our community. Choose Home Trust Bank for all your financial needs, because when it comes to banking, trust matters. Visit them today at hdb.com. Let's talk some ship. Woo! Greetings, shipheads, and welcome to Talking Ship, the Venture Asheville podcast, where we talk about issues and topics in entrepreneurship. Venture Asheville is a high-growth entrepreneurship initiative of the Economic Development Coalition for Asheville, Buncombe County. We build entrepreneurs and get startups funded. I'm Jeffrey Kaplan, this ship's captain, director of Venture Asheville, lover of Hamantaschen, because today we're recording this on Purim. Hamantaschen is, of course, the silly treat we eat to the shape of Haman, who is like a bad man who tried to kill the Jews. We eat the shape of his hat. We turn it into a cookie filled with chocolate, or jams, or Ooh. apricots. And on that note, let me take a quick swig of this, courtesy of Troy and Sons. Mmm. Ah, yum. And that, my friends, is how you fulfill a mitzvah. And if none of the last 20 seconds makes any sense to you, please listen to our sister podcast, Jeffrey Explains Judaism, where there will be <laughs> 613 episodes, each one covering a single mitzvah. At the end of the podcast series, if you listen to each one, you get a coupon for a free bris from the moil of your choice. That is a lot of Purim jokes, so I'm going to walk away from that and just keep on Ooh. trucking. With me, as always, is the wonderful, smart, talented, considerate, and creative Juliana Moonwalker, our master of interactive media. Moonwalker, what is good? Oh, so much is good here in Asheville. I am loving the early spring, and it's beautiful outside, but I am having so many allergies right now. I am yeah. drinking tea. I'm doing yeah. all of the things, but the pollen is out to play this early March and I'm enjoying the sunshine, not enjoying that pollen, but happy to have you back in the States. I Jeff. am. I am also back in the States. I'm not saying I'm happy to be here because part of me is not. Mm -hmm. Part of me is, you know, Juliana, I really miss you. Every, every spot where I was in my sabbatical internationally, I'll be on this hike or this lookout or this winery and thinking Jay Walker would really like uh -oh. it here. Yes. I'm sure that's exactly yeah. uh, what's going through your head. So I've said that to every coworker here. I'm just going to come out and say it. I've, <laughs> I've, 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 I've had this guilt about taking time off, even though I shouldn't. And I said to everybody, I just felt like you would really liked it. Wish you were there. Um, I think we all would have. And as far as pollen, you know, the, the, I don't know, is it, is saying old wives tale, is that canceled? Can I say that? Or is it? I think we can still folklore? probably say that. Let's go with the folklore folk, just for just for the folk, the folk medicine to mm -hmm. have local honey. Local honey. Oh that, my goodness! I have local sense? honey in this green tea that go. I'm sipping on the, right now. Because the idea is, if you drink or eat local honey, it's mm -hmm. made from local pollen, and therefore you're building up your immunization. Mm -hmm. So you can inject yourself with some local honey. Is that how that works? I don't know. That's why I don't have a medical degree. Today, with us, we have an Ash famous, Insta famous, friendly and incredulous entrepreneur, Tyler Koch. Tyler is the kind of person I wish I could see more of. When I see him at events, we end up having a great time because we could talk about serious, hard business stuff, and we also joke around a lot. I'm a huge fan of his business. Actually, my whole family is a fan of his business. Let's bring him in. Tyler Koch, creator, founder, CEO of Pi Za Pizza. Tyler, welcome. Jay and Jay, thank you guys so much for having me today. This is awesome. Let me jump, jump in with my first question. Tyler, is it true you are the hunkiest pizza maker in Asheville? Well, some of my friends do call me girthy, but I don't know if I'm hunky. <laughs> so, <laughs> we do make big pizza, though, for sure. We do. Really delicious, in my opinion. Um, so we see you today. We know you as the impresario of giant pizzas and late night eats in Asheville. I, how did you get into this? Did you grow up in like a neighborhood pizza shop? How do you become the dough loving man you are today? Wow, that's uh, that story could go a long way, but we'll keep it short today. Uh, ultimately, I, I don't have much of a background in pizza other than my mother's an Italian, 
She's in Monteleone and uh, mm-hmm. she's been making small pizzas for the family for the course of time that I know. We have gatherings and everything at home whenever we go back. And uh, I just kind of stumbled into pizza myself by working in the medical industry for a long time, living in New York City for a little bit. Mm-hmm. And then when I transferred here to Asheville, I couldn't get anything late night eats. And then I said, well, what the heck's going on? They got a lot of people drinking beers and banging out late here. Why, right. why can't we get anything late night? And uh, it was in between pizza, hot dogs, and noodles. And I landed on pizza. And it was interesting. a really good- That's so interesting. Uh, you're absolutely right. We are not a late night eats town. Um, I think anytime out past midnight, we end up at Storm Rum Bar. Which yeah. is like which is basically your neighbor, right? There's like not a lot going on um, after midnight. Um, tell us more about your background. So you, where, where'd you grow up? And I, I know you come from a medical device background. And yeah, so, so I'm curious, like where'd you grow up? How did you get the medical devices? And how does medical devices, and, and you're in ORs with surgeons, right? Like how does that lead you to late night eats and pizza? Yeah, so I, uh, I, I grew up in Pennsylvania, up in Butler, Pennsylvania. It's mm-hmm. just a small country town. A real blue collar, and uh, I had a lacrosse scholarship down in Hickory, North Carolina. So it got me down I'm south. Yeah. And then after school, I moved out to California for a medical company. I was doing sales out there. I moved to Knoxville, Tennessee. And then I landed in New York City, running a territory there for this medical device company. And after kind of doing the New York City thing, I was getting out late there, experiencing mm-hmm. the full mm-hmm. New York City lifestyle to its fullest. I uh, kind of got worn out by it, and I wanted to kind of take a jump and come back down south. So I landed with uh, Johnson & Johnson, and that's when I kind of transferred over from more no consulting to, to sales, I would say. And uh, we would uh, kind of go around all over in Hickory. I came up here in Nashville to help a guy at one time. Mm-hmm. The hospital asked me to come up here and run this district. So for three years, I ran that district. And then in the process, uh, I was kind of like wanted to be my own boss and kind of build sure. a culture and things around mm-hmm. My own business that I, I was missing in the corporate world that I was in and it landed on pizza and we made it pretty cool and now it's running pretty well and I now it's my full-time job and yeah we got some expansion on the horizon so I think if, if, if I said to somebody yeah Tyler's come on the podcast he's Tyler he's got the the big pizzas you know the pizza shop the small pizza shop in, in South Slope I don't think the discipline would and the efficiency the way you run that place would come you hear a late night pizza shop you know yeah it's like these big giant pizzas it's like a whole instagram thing like none of the hard work and and go back to think about the discipline comes through um how would the background in med sales being around surgeons being in ors like did you see firsthand the hierarchy and efficiency and how does that impact you today yeah, 100%. So I would say the biggest thing that helped me in the facts of what we're doing now when we're working with a lot of people and making sure that things are done properly, they're doing, they're done quickly, they're getting people in, they're getting people out, and it's done, like you said, in an efficient manner, was all based off of my career in medical. And uh, I was in the trauma surgery, and when we were in trauma surgery, sometimes you might get a call middle of the night you didn't have anything prepared and they're like, Hey, in 30 minutes, we're going in for a proximal tibia surgery. We need you in there. We need all the equipment. We need all that. And, and some of that stuff, you didn't know if it was available or however it goes, but you needed to get it ready. You needed to get it right. So that whenever that doctor was in there, he could save as many minutes as possible because it's extremely uh, expensive to have a patient mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. for a minute at a time. So everything they did was smooth from the scrub tech to the nurses to me helping out some in the, in the middle of that as well. Mm-hmm. And it was just a pure efficiency model to make sure that those people got in, they got treated properly and they got out in the, the quickest time possible. Right. The quicker the time, it's not just uh, better cost savings, also better health outcomes, right? 100%. The less intervention, the better, right? the more pure the experience, I guess. Yep. So you would think like if I saw a resume and you told me, yeah, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a founder, I came out of med devices, I'd be like, oh, sweet. So I bet you're doing something in health tech now or digital technology. And you're like, no, I'm in pizza. Yeah. So when you're evaluating, it's way more what? Way more chill. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> Better hours too from trauma. Yeah. So when you're evaluating, you know, you saw the, the market need for late night eats and you're looking at 
quick and convenience. So I think that's what got you to hot dogs, pizza, or noodles. Mm -hmm. What was your rubric? Like, what was the taxonomy you went through to figure out pizza is the way to go? Um, yeah, so I think definitely, I, I really have never had a background in the food and beverage industry, but I did a lot of research in the process. And I found that whatever you do, however you push it out, you one, you need an incredible atmosphere that people really enjoy when mm -hmm. they're going to that space. We also need a quality product. And then everything in between is the processes and the way things flow and the way customers come in and how they interact with people and how you retain employees and keep those employees mm -hmm. and make sure that they're enjoying themselves as well. So it was just kind of like this big basket of all these things that I condensed and simplified and made it as easy as possible so both the consumer and the worker can enjoy what they're doing. So what's amazing about that, Tyler, is that you encapsulate what I call entrepreneurial optimism. The idea that we can entrepreneur our way out of this problem. So you don't start off thinking about the spreadsheet. You don't start off thinking about the margins and the profit. You start with, this is the experience I want to create. How do I make it work? Yep, absolutely. Right? You will solve that problem and get creative and go through the constraints, and whatever it does to never sacrifice the experience. Um, I'll share my experience. Like I, I told you about the experience my wife and I had one crazy night at Paisa, and I'll, tell you, I'll, I'll get that into the episode later. Um, but I want to go deeper, but not deep dish because you don't make deep dish pizza. Let's go a little deeper. We don't like that. We, when we talk about efficiency, speed, and quality, it actually comes out in the ingredients and it comes out in the, the product. Can we talk about like how all these things factored into these giant? And if you haven't seen one of these pizzas, like go online. It's what, 38, 39 inches diameter? 28 inches with 28 a diameter? Yeah. I mean, I think I could I could hula hoop in that, and not yeah. a very big guy. But it's <laughs> it's if you're watching the podcast on YouTube, I'm doing the move. Uh, so how do you come up with that? Like, and how does that play into the reliability, the consistency, the employee training, the customer experience? Why a giant pizza? How is it made? What's so and, wh and why is it, how is it so good? I should also say that it's a delicious pizza. Thank you, I appreciate that, and um, I, I would say. Uh, at the start of my entrepreneurial journey, I think being incredibly ignorant to what I was getting myself into could have been the best thing possible mm -hmm. for me. And being that, you know, being ignorant, not knowing much and kind of wanting to simplify things just to make sure it's right, kind of played into our model in the long run. So, you know, our model, we have five options and mm -hmm. you don't make any substitutions or changes from those. And you either get a whole pie that's 28 inches or you get a one foot slice. So yeah. when you really limit it down to five options and the ability to only pick from those five options, then your quality consistency becomes incredibly easier. And just by doing that, it's, it's efficient. You can have quality ingredients. You have good margins. Your payroll is one of the mm -hmm. biggest things that I've learned is, is the hardest in being an entrepreneur. And your payroll numbers aren't as high because since you've simplified processes, you don't need 10 people working at the same time. You can get away with five people where a lot of restaurants could mm -hmm. use eight to 10 people working that, in that space. Um, so just keeping it simple, it has just done wonders for us. And it's been able to kind of let us focus more on like what, what our vibe is or what our atmosphere is or right. enjoy their space. And they get to put their own little creative art into every pizza that they make. And with quality ingredients, mm -hmm. I think it just comes out with an awesome product. So talk about the product then, uh, recipes. You've got like a cheese, there's a meat, there. Is it, they give you your four standards and one rotating. Yeah. So right? we have a, a garden, a yeah. roni, a sausage, and a cheese. Those are our four standards. Mm -hmm. And the fifth one, it rotates every month. We do a, a different monthly special and we have fun, cool, exciting names for them. And sometimes they reflect like right now we're doing a March, uh, Munch Madness, which is a play on <laughs> March Madness. Mm -hmm. and, uh, like we did a video. And the video is is each one of the team members putting their own little topping on the pizza, just like a team would, like a yeah, cool, like a cutting the net or something. <laughs> like, yeah, so it's kind of playing into some of those things. We have a lot of fun with that. Yeah, and um, it kind of spices it up. It gets people keep on coming every month because we do different things, and mm -hmm. sometimes it gets real unique. We did a macaroni and cheese pizza uh, mm -hmm. a few months ago, and that was fun. And then we just keep on coming up with some new ones. And do you ever collaborate with local folks or other products in town for the pizzas? Yeah, uh, something like we, we've done a lot of collaborations with some other people like Bear's Barbecue, 
cool. some other small places yeah. that we get some stuff with, but um, our main number one collaboration, and uh, I'm going to plug them real good because it's mm -hmm. our favorite, is Hickory Nut Gap here in town. They're sure, locally sure, sure. farm, all the generational business and yeah. care of you. Yep. And sustainable. It's it's great, but their, their products are absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. So uh, a slice, like a sausage slice that I particularly wouldn't go for usually, mm -hmm. uh, one of my favorites here in town because it's just such good meat. And then our Munch Madness slice for special, it's got like a hot Italian sausage from them. So we do a great partnership with them and we love working with them that they just provide us really, really quality ingredients. Yeah, Ager, the Ager family is a kind of legendary family out here. Good and people. They're absolutely good folks to work with. Um, so talk about designing the customer flow. And my, my experience was like, you know, I have little kids. I rarely get out. And one night my wife and I did get a night out. Um, I went to a concert or something like that. It was like a late night for us. So, of course, we ended up at Paisa around midnight, maybe. Perfect and, time. Yeah. Lines out the door, right? I've never been inside. I've had your pizza a ton of times from events because you're so philanthropic. You sponsor it a lot. We order it a lot for our events. I, I, I was not new to the pizza. I never had it fresh, though. I've always like, had it like sitting out in a box and have an event for a couple hours. Still good. Anyway, we're there. Lines out the door. We're working through the line. We get to the front. And the first thing the guy says to us is, you guys are locals, right? And we're like, yeah, how'd you know? And he's like, I can just tell. Gave us 10% off. Like, I've been, I've been begging restaurant owners to do more for locals because it, you know, you're right in the south slope. All of our visitors and tourists, we love them, but sometimes they block us out or price us out or out reserve yep. us from restaurants we want to go to. So immediately being like, oh, locals are really taken care of here is the first thing. And that's, we, we want to keep that no matter how many stores we open up, we want to keep yeah. that in every single facet because it's so important. Before I was starting Paisa, uh, I was actually thinking about opening like a, a company that did local memberships. So you could go around to mm -hmm. all these restaurants and when everyone, all the tourists were in town, you could flash your local membership and you get in front of the line, you get mm -hmm. wait time, a little discount of sorts, just to make those people feel good because when you get in a busy town like Asheville, it's really difficult to get some food whenever you got mm -hmm. all these tours coming up. I've I honestly, and you know the people I've asked, I've asked some of our, our best known restaurant tours in town. So could you just put like five tables aside? Like I know you got a big restaurant, right? Like make those five tables always for locals. So if I wait in line or I call for a reservation, you just have like a local section, maybe, you know? You know or like let us jump the line a little bit if you're a local something. Like yeah, but it's like this is why like, no one in town takes reservations either because the market demand is so high for each mm -hmm. seat at every restaurant. That, anyway, that's enough bashing our restaurant scene and why I'm always so hungry and can't get out enough. But anyway, so we're at Paisa. We get our pizza. It's delicious. You know, and so yeah, it's a one foot slice. And instinctually, because it's, it's a thin crust New York style, even though it's huge, the instinct is to fold it, right? You fold a slice of pizza. And yeah. you saw me do this once where I folded it. And it didn't bend. It didn't flop. It stayed yeah. like as if I was holding a ruler. Like it was holding like a board. I mean that like to have the 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 the, the pie crust and the dough be that crispy and solid, but still so thin, so it doesn't get too soggy. Like this is the perfect crust. Anyway, it's hard to do it on a thin crust. It was, it was very impressive. Yeah, that's our that's our saying. What a dough. We got it trademarked. So that's yeah. what we take a lot of a lot of pride in. Mm -hmm. and it's a science. I didn't realize how much of a science totally. dough was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we get into it, and even to the fact of like adding ice to the dough to cool it down and making sure the speeds on uh, the mixer change in intervals of four to two minutes and at different times because that heats up differently and it changes the chemistry of what's going mm. on. It's a science, and that it was really cool to learn. That's fascinating. And the last part of our, our visit was we're sitting outside and. It's clearly a bachelor party was trying to get three full 28 inch giant pies out the door into a hatchback. So there's like four dudes in his hat and they're all big dudes in a hatchback. And so the thing about your door is it's not wide enough to carry the pizza out completely horizontally, right? You have to <laughs> angle it to the side. Wide enough. It's perfectly wide. Is it? Okay. Put your fingers in the box right through. Okay. But you got to go butt first so the door doesn't hit you first. And so that must anyway. So these watching these bachelor bros can't get out the door, and everyone's just like cracking up, and they're laughing, and we're laughing. The staff is laughing, and that's part of like the experience, right? Is 
it, it's not intimidating. It's so friendly and fun and light. Anyway, these guys finally get the pizzas out the door and they're looking at their car and they can't get it in the car door. And they're putting, so first they start with the windows down, right? Yeah. Then they open the door. Then you see guys like moving bags. They had to open the hatch back of the car and slide it in from behind. And then they drove off. And by the end of it, everyone's clapping, doing an ovation. They got it in. And yep. like, that was more fun than I've had at any restaurant in town in a long time. Thank you. And, you know, it was all about, all about the, just the cool, fun, friendly experience that we have there. And that that's honestly true to my heart right there is, is exactly what you just said is like, Anyone can make pizza, anyone mm -hmm. can make it a little bit bigger, anyone can make it taste good. But when you go into space, how do you feel? Do you mm -hmm. want to return to that space when you're done? Did you have a good experience? Did you get to laugh a little bit? Did you get mm -hmm. to know the people that are working there? And that's, that's what right. we're trying to curate. And we're trying to do it in a lot of places other than Asheville as well. Yeah, it creates this affinity, this love for the brand and the, right, the experience. Like we're, we're, we go back anytime, anytime someone's ordering pizza from Paisa, we're stoked. I know last night we did a, a small event, we ordered pizza from Paisa. And like I said before, you've been so philanthropic, um, not to put you on the spot, but I know it's like you're not, you don't say no a lot. People ask you to donate a pizza to an event or for a nonprofit. You're pretty quick yes, to say yes. Goes. We're going to get popular now. Yeah, yeah. But, that's, that's the venture Asheville bump for you. Yeah. Um, so it, I, I find it fascinating how, how data driven you are when it comes to the slices and the sizes and the work, everything you do, right? There is, it's you, um, one of the keys to innovation is, is experimentation. And this book I was reading over the, over the, we're not sabbatical was saying that the lead killer of innovation is experience that people rely on their experience and their bias, what worked for them. It doesn't mean it's going to work in the future. And mm -hmm. so the, the key enabler of innovation is experimentation and you use so much data and technology, you're so, you're so apt to lean into new process for improvement constantly. Um, and it reminds me of when you pitched at 1 million cups, if you remember your answer for this question, someone said to you, do you have a gluten-free pizza? Do you remember your answer for this? Because I do. It, it stood out to me. It was an incredible answer. I can't remember what I said specifically, but I'm sure I said I'm not close to the idea. <laughs> you said... Um, in Asheville, twenty oh, percent of diners yes. yep. are seeking a gluten option, a gluten free option. Yeah. And he said it's just it's higher than almost anywhere else. And it's not enough for us to have a standalone. And also you said we can't get the dough right, we can't make the pizza right. So we're not gonna put a substandard product out there for such a small part of the market. Correct. And I was like yeah, that's, that's I, I get it a lot, and mm -hmm. especially people who ask for gluten free or vegan stuff. And uh the, I just don't think at, for our specific business, it's not everyone's business. Uh, I don't think the data points really show, you know, tremendous leaps and bounds that I would make mm -hmm. money that would make it more of a hassle for my staff to like right. lessen their work-life balance. And that's way more important to me than providing a couple people with like a gluten-free vegan mm -hmm. pizza is to make sure that staff is simplified. They have a good time when they go in and they, they put that work hat on and they're still genuinely themselves and they can go home and they're not upset and they're not, they feel okay. They're they're gonna come back tomorrow just as happy as they came today. Yeah, so I I just find that like that is such a, a telling example of who you are as an entrepreneur, your decision making process, and the way you take data in and use it to make informed decisions. Um, and, and considering all the stakeholders you have to to worry about as a business owner. Um, I'm gonna switch gears. When I when I went into an accelerator with my um my my I had an app for people with dogs called Dog Friendly. And mm -hmm. it was a found your location and it showed you every dog friendly restaurant, park, hotel, beach, hiking trail, like anywhere you're traveling in the world, in the world, U S and, and, and Puerto Rico. Um, if you had a dog with you, we, 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 we planned your travel itinerary for using the app geolocating good stuff. Anyway, uh, the advice I got at that time, cause I spelled it D O G dog friendly P H R E N D L Y. Cause I couldn't get any other URL or any other, um, uh, just the trademarks, whatever. And so there's a branding expert named Jonathan Prince at, in, at, at the time, Groundwork Labs, lives in Durham. Uh, and, and he helped me come up with this name, but the advice was never name your business a commonly mis, uh, a misspelled version of a commonly spelled word. <laughs> because in a tech environment, I tell somebody, yeah, my website's dog friendly. They're not searching with pH. And so there's a lot of SEO issues we had taking an original 
phrasing, a, a spelling of this uh, commonly spelled word. And I wonder, is that a problem for Pizaw? And if it's not, I think I have an assumption as to why. So once you answer the first part, spelling pizza, Pizaw, play on the word, is it problematic? So uh, I used to work uh, in college. I was a salesperson for a furniture company that we made SEO websites for the furniture industry. So I had the privilege of working right next to this really, really intelligent guy named Michael Stiles. And he got invited to all the Google SEO stuff. And I learned a little bit. And what I found is like when I go on Google or the sorts, I don't particularly just search pizza. I, I search best pizza. What's the mm -hmm. best pizza? What's the best in town, best downtown? Interesting. So those keywords, we have them posted all over our website. We're the biggest and the best in Asheville. And that populates more in SEO than Paisa or pizza. So if you get the best in that SEO pushes forward, then indirectly the second hand of whenever you do search pizza, we're already up on the front on the top, top right. end. Of that. So I wondered if it was less of an issue also in a retail brick and mortar environment where you are your location, whereas like we're, we're looking, anybody in America searching a dog friendly place, we want to track you, right? So we're totally dependent on internet search. Whereas you have people who are in town looking for food at the moment. And so all the trip advisors and Yelps and all the other things that would feed into the SEO as well, the backlinks mm -hmm. essentially from travel sites. Yeah. And, and that's again, like I couldn't praise enough for all the bartenders and the work, work staff mm -hmm. in the town that have recommended us over the years and we've taken care of them hopefully as well. Um, but it, just the word of mouth. And then once you get people saying, oh, pie, and even if they don't know the za part, then they search pie online and then you get populated mm -hmm. in and Google starts picking up and it's just, I think you're right. It's, it's not on a national level yet, but at least we've built it on this like little market of Asheville mm -hmm. right now. And then hopefully it'll do the same when we go into some bigger area. So on one hand, yeah, it's a little market. On the other hand, it's like the top food destination in North America. Yeah, right. Right. So little market, but significant impact and yeah. uh, makes you a leader. So on that, you've hinted at this a bit. I want to hear about it. Expansion. What does it mean? Do I call 1-800-PIESA and open a franchise? What do I got to do? So that's, um, I've been teetering back and forth and, and it's really tough because you want to keep this culture and you want to mm -hmm. keep the vibe of what I got going on here and you want to bring it to other places. So I think I've really kind of finalized my thought process on that and that I want to open up at least five corporate stores that are just like the ones cool. here in Asheville. So uh, similar right now, square footage, same menu, same culture. A little bit, a little bit different uh, square footage in some of these bigger areas, specifically okay. like Charlotte. I'm looking at now because mm -hmm. the volume's so massive that you you oh, need okay. more space. I need a bigger walk-in. I need more prep stations. I, things that like I really didn't know in this first one. Interesting. Uh, I'm sure, really sure. going to be super more efficient on these other ones, and I would love to talk about that when we build that too. Um, but yeah, it's just little things that you think like, oh, I've got to take this this big heavy dough bin and I have to take it across the hallway into a cooler. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do that. So it's like, oh, this is a two-step process instead of a cross the whole store process. Interesting. So, so a little bit more what, um, what's your timeline you think for five stores next two years, three years? Uh, it's all about capital funding in okay. where we go in the next store. I think our next store is the most vital uh, thing for Pizaz is if we can get into Charlotte where I'm looking at right now and I solidify it, hopefully I hear back from them today about that lease uh, and that starts cranking out money, that'll give me the opportunity to kind of cool. go quickly open up some more. Uh, right now, we'll be really great in Nashville and I can't say anything bad about Asheville, but uh, if you want to really start opening them up like two and two every year or two every mm -hmm. three years, you, you need a little bit higher volume and that's why we're going towards the- Interesting. The yeah, I mean, it'll, it'll be great in several years from now to look back on this process and go more in depth on the capital side. Yeah. Like, you know, it's, it's obviously like way too close to talk about it now, but like looking at cash flows and can you revenue fund, right? Revenue generated funding for new expansions or is that going to create loan opportunities for you, right? And what kind of partners are bringing in? So in five years, I'd love to revisit where we are today. I would and too. How, and and how, watch that growth and how it went. Yeah, it's, it's a unique situation right. it's because mm -hmm. I used my money for the first one and uh, right. I drained myself. I sold my house and bought my business partner out this year. Mm -hmm. and, um, it's kind of like all been on my own right now. But now as I'm kind of learning a little bit more and gaining more knowledge about how these businesses work and how they scale, 
I'm not going to use my own money anymore. Right. Kind of like put up my own house just to, to make the business survive. So uh, we're looking into loans now with a couple mm -hmm. different people and maybe we might talk to you guys about that as well. But sure. ultimately, I think the, the way to do the next one is to go down the loan route and have someone I else. I think so. I think you're right. Yeah. It's, if you start giving away equity now, obviously on the eve of such expansion, you're, you're going to have such little leverage in your equity stake, right? So you want to have the, the momentum and traction to show your valuation being so high. Yep. Uh, well, you know, I, we can talk about, I'd love to get a piece yeah. and talk to you about this some more. Um, dude, so cool. You know, my family went from Havana, Cuba to Charlotte. Um, so we have immense love for that city, what it did to welcome these Cuban refugees in the sixties. And um, I hope it's, it, and seeing Charlotte, right? I've known since I was a kid, right? We used to live there. Seeing how much it's grown, I, I, I hope and I expect that it's going to be a very welcome environment for you too. I hope so. I really, I really do. I wish. I hope. I hope for a wish. Yeah, I think I think it'll be successful. Um, as per tradition, the final question goes to the smart, talented, wonderful master of interactive media, Jay Moon Walker. Jay, hit Tyler with a buzzer beater. In the uh -oh. You're making me blush. A buzzer mm. beater. Yes, of course. Well, kind of tailing off of that talk about your expansion you know i remember when you guys first opened it was kind of the tail end of the pandemic well not the tail end it went on for a while didn't it i was in the middle of it to be honest <laughs> it was kind of right some say it's it. still happening some, some say, say. <laughs> some say. Um, yeah like early 2021 if i'm remembering correctly and now it's spring of 2023 you're talking about expanding in that two years yeah. you know it's just it's flown by what, especially now that you're looking towards expansion, uh, what would you say? And I know we've talked about a lot of lessons learned, but what would you say is like the key thing you're taking forward um, in the in these two years of experience? It's in a, I know it's going to sound generic and the same thing you probably heard from a lot of entrepreneurs. And I am just staying as open minded as possible about everything. There's mm -hmm. not one thing that I want to say I know everything about. I learn things every day, every week when we have our manager meetings and. I uh, get to pull in more people and like bring another GM on board so that we can open up their space. And I learned from something from them. And it's true to, you know, what a lot of the very successful people have said is like, if you got good people around you, then mm -hmm. you'll do just fine. And I really put a lot of things on them to teach me stuff. And I'm just here to make decisions and make sure that things are in the right direction that we're going to go upwards most of the time. Well, awesome. Seems like you have a lot of great people around you. So I absolutely do. That's that's the reason why we have whatever we call success here. And it's because of all the people that work for us. Wait, did I did I miss that important detail? You opened your first location in 2021. 2020, September 2020, September we opened. September 2020. Right, so you're deep. Yeah. You're, this is pre-vaccine. Like you are deep in. We're still locked down. We don't know what the hell we're doing, right? People don't want to. We had spacing out tables and restaurants. Uh, you know that makes me wonder. Um, so we're like you're three years later, um, not even two and a half years for you. We always years. said, you know, in these pan, in, in these downturns, economic downturns, whether it's a recession because of financial crisis or a health crisis, whatever it is, a war, it doesn't matter. In these crunch times, we find the next generational market leaders, right? So you go back to the 08, 9, 10 recession, right? The Great Recession, Uber, Lyft, Airbnb, like every household tech name you know came out of the Bay Area at that time. Yep. And so as the the herd is thinning out a little bit, seeing who's made it and who's on a growth trajectory, I wonder if we'll say, because Pi Za was built in the hardest and most constrained supply chain event of our history and the hardest uh, labor workforce crisis of our history, they've got this magic operational recipe that lets them scale and grow to be the next generational market leader, the next big thing. I, I hope we do. And I think uh, we're doing really good on the growth aspect. Uh, we've, we've done a lot of pivoting. And I think that's one of the most important things as an entrepreneur is just to mm -hmm. constantly pivot, figure it out, move on. And uh, we've done it. And here we are, 2023. And hopefully we're going to the moon. So I look forward All to right. it in five years. Yeah, we'll do it again. Jay Walker, if you could send a calendar invite out for five years from today, Absolutely. if you just put that down in our exchange, that'd be swell. Tyler Koch, CEO, founder, creator of the biggest pizza in Asheville, and some say the best. <laughs> Tyler, man, I hope to see you again soon. 
uh, thank you for make, making some time and talking shit with us. Thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. And I hope you have a wonderful day. You too.